Did you know that only 56% of employees think that their company's executives care about their well-being, while in contrast, 91% of the C-suite thinks their employees believe they care about it? That's a big disconnect. Employee experience is directly tied to digital experience. Now, I remember being excited for one of my first big company jobs, MCI WorldCom. Hmm? IT issued company laptops, and eventually we got the latest BlackBerry phones with physical keyboards and software tools well before software as a service was a, was a thing. Well, over the years, new workflows kept getting rolled out, supported by better end-user hardware, but with the same frustrations. Isolated tool sets forcing us to repeat basic information that would slow things down, and all of us hoarding digital assets for fear of not finding them again. Well, in my 20 years at Cisco, I navigated multiple tool evolutions and interacted with people I never met, including in HR and IT, never physically met. Well, we've reached a critical juncture. We're drowning in innovation, clinging to our outdated org charts. Your next big leap forward will not come from new hardware or software, but from a deliberate data-based awareness and execution. Today's show is about Worldwide Technologies' research report, Digital Workspace Priorities for 2024. Now, in here, it argues that a world-class employee experience is critical for organizational success. Today's talent demands technology that matches their personal experience. No professional willingly clocks into a digital time capsule forced to work with yesterday's tools. Well, there are five research priorities that we're going to touch on here. Number one, many organizations who focus on customer experience or CX improvements are neglecting employees. Now, smart organizations are optimizing employee experience to enhance customer experience. Priority two is automation and AI are not new in this space, but they do lack effective planning and acceptance. You can't simply slather them across your organization and expect some kind of success. A better digital experience won't appear from a mess of redundant technologies led by separate departments. The hybrid work debates continue, but work doesn't wait. Creating a location-independent digital employee experience is key. We need smart spaces and integrated tool sets that encourage work anywhere. And then this last priority emphasizes the power of an inclusive culture. Culture will keep these priorities glued together. Now steering it, guiding that culture, that's a bit more of an art. Well, today we have two digital workspace experts with us, David Rosenblatt, Distinguished Solutions Architect, and Jared Brummer, Global Technical Solutions Architect. Both of these guys are leaders within worldwide technology, and our conversation centers on priority two, introducing AI and automation into the workforce. We're going to start with a little disambiguation on the terminology. This is one topic where I keep thinking we don't have enough letters to account for all the similar sounding acronyms. But understanding the difference between digital employee experience and mere monitoring, that's crucial. It's the shift from big brother to big benefits, unlocking actionable insights that boost satisfaction and productivity. Now, while this initiative may seem overwhelming at first, we're gonna focus on two key innovations, dynamic persona modeling and DIM scoring. These tools help define excellence for specific personas, making your digital employee monitoring scoring more actionable. Additionally, we're going to explore the Digital Employee Experience Maturity Curve, a actionable tool applicable across various topics, because knowing where to go starts with knowing where you are. By breaking down these concepts, we can simplify the path to enhancing digital experiences. Two questions to kick things off. Can you quantify the impact of your digital tools on your employee productivity? Have you identified clear, actionable steps to enhance your employee's digital work environment? Well, no worries. We're going to identify the digital friction and get rid of it. The idea is simple. The execution, not so much. Well, today's guests have spent years helping others pull this off, and now they're going to help us do the same. Today's show explores how technology, AI, ops, and automation can transform the employee experience. Welcome to Worldwide Technology Presents Research, insights powered by the Advanced Technology Center. WWT Presents Research. All right, guys. Well, I've been looking forward to this. This is a – I feel like it's an acronym-challenged discussion because I feel like we were limited to like four or five letters and and how many combinations can we prove with those. Uh -huh. But before we get into that detail, let's introduce yourselves for anyone that's not familiar with you. David, do you mind introducing yourself? 
Yeah, David Rosenblatt. I'm the Distinguished Solution Architect at WWT, and I cover digital workspace, which for us includes pretty much anything you use to uh, uh, you touch from a technology standpoint or to do your job, right? And did you say you're the specialist or a specialist? I would say the. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, thought, I didn't expect anything less. I was just curious. We'll, we'll see if Jared has any reaction to that. Jared, you mind telling us what you do? I, I was going to say, yeah, he made my, my introduction really easy. So Jared Bremer, I'm the global technical solutions architect uh, for our end user computing part of our digital workspace practice. And usually my balance is, is to actually bring the reality to what Dave is uh, talking about. Oh, I love is. that contrast. So you're saying David has a habit of promising things that you have to figure out how to deliver on? Exactly. Okay. That's an awesome relationship, though. Um, I think that's going to work well. Well, getting back to the acronyms, David, let's have you uh, maybe simplify us, uh, simplify this for us just a little bit. But So we got DEX, Digital Employee Experience, DIM which is more monitoring, I guess. And how do these relate to each other? Where does it fit in with EX and CX? What's important to understand for our discussion? So I kind of, if you kind of look at it uh, almost like a, a funnel, right? From the, uh, the, at the, the tallest or widest part of it is employee experience and customer experiences themselves, right? Which is, you know, from an employee experience perspective, it is the sum of, uh, you know, everything that you interact with from a, um, as, as you work, everything from HR policies and, uh, how enabled you are and what your experience is from your, you know, pre-joiner join as you move change in the organization all the way till when you leave. And if you look at below that DEX being the digital employee experience, which is the sum of all your interactions, you know, the aggregate of all your interactions that you have within the technology, as well as a layer that can inform um, with different quantitative and qualitative information into the overarching employee experience. So it's kind of that digital kind of translation of the overarching employee experience pieces. And then DEM itself are the employee uh, monitoring tools and other things are, are the specific tooling and capabilities that we have that allow us to do that quantitative and qualitative kind of measurement. So it's almost like that tooling and the other informational insights that you have. So as, as you kind of kind of narrow down into that funnel, those are kind of like the relationship they have with there. And to answer the question about the EX and CX, the, those to us have always been two sides of the same coin, right? One of the easiest ways to kind of define that is is the easiest way to, to create customer frustration or friction is to have employee friction. And one of the first things employees ever have friction with is technology. You know, the number of times you've called into a call center and someone said, my system's running slow and now they're frustrated, you're frustrated and everyone else along there is probably like the easiest kind of example of how like from a technology, uh, friction and frustration gets translated to employee friction and frustration, which then translates to uh, customer friction and frustration. Well, I heard you take a breath there, so I'm going to jump in and ask Jared. <laughs> I'll just mess up with you. But Jared, I now that I think he gave a, a, a great explanation, but it's part of your color on this. Is it true? Because as, as I was trying to define these, in, in some places, it feels like DEX is considered, when we talk about the digital employee experience being the more active or action-oriented response to the monitoring. So the monitoring is almost a subset, or, or it becomes a subset that's more inclusive and actionable, perhaps, than just thinking about digital monitoring. It's like, what can I take action on? Is that a way to distinguish these, or am I making up stuff? So you're, you're, you're right on track. Is really for DEM is really what we see it as is it's taking that what goes beyond the monitoring and just letting it be there as reactionary is how can we make this more proactive side is how can we actually take this data and be starting to get ahead of things? How can we actually get ahead of a user calling in? You know, can we actually say that we observe that something is happening that's impacting their experience and do the little things of whether or not it's a pop up that says, hey, we saw that you've had this problem, but then go to that next layer and actually start automating and letting that user be empowered to take those automation saying, we saw that you had something that impacted your experience. We know how to fix this. Would you like to click one of these? Or even go through and do things of, would you like us to open a ticket for you and attach all the relevant information? <laughs> so it makes IT happier. It takes a user that would probably just be a dissatisfied user that you know usually are single digits who actually report a problem uh, into their IT department. You start getting more of that data. And it's what it just becomes that it supports that DEX experiences really where DEX, you know, Dave did a great, ex, you know, explanation, but I, I like to summar, just summarize it where DEX is the intersection between IT 
and the rest of the business to the users. It's just how do the users use IT? That's where Dex sits there in the middle and just says, how do we make those two work together? Well, it's interesting because when it comes to measuring that, so you mentioned this notion of, uh, you know, collecting, uh, being able to be so proactive on it that you're notifying the user beforehand. And and part of the the steps that I talked about in the introduction concern uh, step number five, which is around a culture, which I kind of describe culture as being something that can wrap it all around. Because my first reaction in the absence of having the proper culture would be if I got a notification that I could click to cure something that I've been told about is it's got to be spam because that feels like that's the first thing. But if I'm in a culture and I recognize the interface and it's a standardized way in which I'm communicated with from the IT department of where I'm employed, that's a different matter. And so I, I think that's interesting the way that comes around. But then I always think, OK, well, this is easier said than done. And David, you mentioned quantification. I'm going to put this um, – I think it's a DIM score. And this – I believe this is a concept that you've been pioneering in terms of how to visualize this. But there's there's elements that WWT has kind of refined over time to say this is a numerical value that you could place on what? How, how do you explain how to quantify so, and then operate on that? Very often I, I refer to DEX or DEM as being kind of your GPA – for your digital transformation. How good are you doing in an aggregate in order to um, really deliver the tools and capabilities that employees need in their environment to do their job? And, and you pointed to the culture, and et cetera. If you take kind of a, a culture of employee first, or you know, uh, if you look at it from an IT perspective as the duty of IT to provide the tools and capabilities that people need to do their job better, then it, it, you're looking to see like, well, how well am I servicing these different groups of employees? And very often with those, we, we look at it kind of as like the, the usual suspects that are contained within like a deck score or a dem score of like things that we usually look at. And starting off closest to the employee is like employee sediment. How do I feel about the tools and capabilities? Am I enabled to do my job? Right. And then it's like, OK, well, how do I measure the application performance? If, if, if the applications are what I use in the digital world to do my job, whether it's, you know, entering information or, or uh, you know, scanning stuff in a warehouse, if you're a frontline worker or, um, you know, whatever data entry type, you know, database type stuff or whatever access that you're doing in order to do your work. How, how performant is that application? How well is the device I'm using working, right? You know, am I running into issues all the way across it? Obviously connectivity, everybody loves to um, blame the network, right? And half the, half the people that we see deploy Dem index tools that come from a network background are looking for mean time to innocence. How quickly can it not be my fault, right? Um, the security and security friction, right? You know, how many times am I having to log in? What are all the multi-factors? All those other things associated to it, as well as am I meeting the good um, uh, situation and other stuff and meeting uh, all the security constraints that I need to? And then I do, And then at, at the end of it, similar to what Jared's saying around the automation and the other pieces, how's the operation support? When something is broken or something is not performing or working, how can I resolve it? And when you kind of gather all those things up, it kind of creates a sum of what your experience is and how you're interfacing and enabled within the technology, as well as being able to, like we talked about earlier in the session, you know, as well as being able to take that information and and lift it up outside the technology realm to track sediment around things like, you know, return to office policies or something else along those lines, right? What can we give back to the business or the organization that shows that the technology is being an enabler? as well as to tune it, right? And go, hey, let's let's figure out what's going around with it. Because the same thing is is the, the deck scores can be different, very different for different personas. You could have a very good deck score for your back office people, while people that are your frontline workers or even people that are back office people in another location could have a much poorer experience because of different choices you made within the IT stack. Yeah, that, that was, you're hitting on personas, which, because I was curious, and Jared, I don't know if you want to jump in on this one. When it comes to kind of personas, is is that the key to saying, well, how do you begin to say what a good score is or not? I want to talk about where the data comes from in a moment, but how do we say this score is good or bad? So the, you know, what probably if you've seen some of the stuff where we talk about personas, a lot of the measures that we've got here on our empl digital employee experience scores are direct ties into a persona. You know, what is your security? What is your connectivity? What are the applications you're using? What are your uh, data that you're using? What is the devices you're using? These all make up what we call as part of our dynamic personas that, you know, match with those users. And so as we're measuring those for across the different personas where Dave brought up is we might have a poor experience on one side, um, you know, for a persona, but the other side might be, you know, another persona might be working fine. What we're using is this 
quantitative data around the digital employee experience monitoring tools to be measuring these different aspects of it. And what we find is different organizations actually have different priorities, where some of them maybe has real distributed workforce. Connectivity might be much higher on their priority. So they might literally turn that knob up and say, I'm going to prioritize as part of my DEX score, my connectivity scores. But then they say, you know, we're in a highly regulated industry. We know security is going to cause maybe some slower logons. So we might tune that one down, you know, a little bit because we know that's a cost trade-off, right? We want to be more secure and have less data breaches, but it's going to slow down our login types. So things like that is kind of what we find is actually most organizations actually have some of these knobs that they're going to turn and tune as part of these solutions to give them their score, and it's going to be customized to them. And I, just to follow up with, with Jared, the, one of the critical things I always say about these scores is if I give you a number and don't tell you what lever to pull in order to raise that a number, then there, what's the point in the number, right? Um, so you, you have to have the level of visibility and insights to see what's there. And additionally, you, you have to kind of have an idea of what good looks like to start off with, because you can baseline something off of a, a set of capabilities or other areas, but you can baseline, you know, a crap experience, right? Um, and it looks just fine, right? Uh, according to all the tooling and all things like that, because nothing's ever changed. But without really understanding the workflows or the uh, the capabilities required for the different personas, it could just be that, yeah, it's the, you know, same crap that was there before. And just your uh, employees just got tired of complaining about it. I don't know if this is really going anywhere, but feel free to use it if it does. But you mentioned the the kind of the, the metaphor of the GPA being a guide. Well, now I think about if uh, setting your wrong uh, baseline is kind of like having a bell curve that's set, you know, ridiculously. <laughs> um, because it, yeah, you know, yeah. if, if, if passing is a 45, right, um, then, uh, it, you know, uh, no one mastered any of the concepts. Right. But uh, but the guy with a, a, a 52, right, has a has an A. Right. Yeah. No. Yes. That's, that's valid. I like that one. I'll, I'll steal it. Please do. You can improve upon yeah. it, too, please. Because I've, 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 one thing I've learned from you is if I walk into my class and I see that, oh, crud, David's in this class and I'm turning right back around because that's <laughs> going to mess up my curve. But um, and I need no, that it's, curve. It, it's a great example because that's something we actually see out of a lot of interest, you know, interest as we're looking at dim tools is don't just tell me how I'm doing compared to myself, but tell me how I'm doing against my industry peers. And a lot of that is that exact reason is the, a lot of the baselining is if we baseline at a poor experience, yes, you can tell me what I can maybe do to improve it, but I don't know how bad I'm doing until I compare it against, you know, some, <laughs> some other benchmark. Yeah. Cause how many times I've gotten something and I go, <laughs> wait, is that good? You know, and, and then now what, uh, am, are you just gaslighting me? You know, is this just to keep me unstable? It was the, it's the, is my AI or my, my DEX tool smarter than a fifth grader, right? You know, kind of model set, right? You know, is, is, is it going to be performant enough to do the job that I need it to, right? Or is it, you know, you know? Well, let's talk just, about how these things are measured because I feel like I, I can see some things when we talk about security and connectivity. There's some things we've been measuring and monitoring, uh, to various degrees for years. And most organizations probably have some degree of that in there. But I'm also conscious of the fact because I think it, uh, either one of you had mentioned, I think it was Jared, but it was in regards to, you know, when an employee calls in and they're having an issue and we just want to resolve the issue quickly and stuff. But then you mentioned when they don't call in or there's an issue that you're proactively aware of, because I think we all probably go through something in our head, especially if we know even a little bit about technology where I'm like, well, I'm going to reboot before I call tech support. I'm going to just see if that cleans it up because that's the first thing they're going to ask me is check my power supply or whatever it is. And then uh, but then other things. And so it's like how often are employees perhaps disguising that sentiment or it's hard to measure what their real thing is because they're not complaining. They're not filling out a survey. They're kind of plunging through because that's kind of how we've learned how to get work done these days. <laughs> yeah, we, we see that quite often and it, you know, leads to, you know, either just shadow IT or users talking to each other, being unsatisfied or, you know, reflects back on the customer experience of where they're just, you know, not as, not as helpful to that customer. They're not going to go that extra mile or they're not going to, you know, go outside of their exact, you know, job boundaries is we see that quite a bit. And what it comes down to is this is where Dex needs to go beyond just being an IT tool to be in working with the business is you can't just leave it there and hope that it tells you when there's a problem. You need to be going in there and analyzing and saying, what is impacting my scores today? What do I need to do to improve those? But then be combining those with saying, what are some of these triggers that we know could be impacting 
from the business side of, hey, if this form that a user is using as they're filling out when they're taking one of those customer calls isn't working right or its response time is low, we need to go be measuring that. And when it does happen, we need to be start trying to track down why it's happening quickly and like prioritizing those alerts. So it's really that intersection of understanding truly what is the user doing as part of their job that impacts whether or not their IT experience becomes poor. And a lot of times IT doesn't know that. So Even one if we thing have the that data. I'll, I'll add to what Jared's saying is, you know, tracking the employee sentiment is is very important in these types of things, right? Just, just to be clear, you're saying sentiment, not sediment. Sentiment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Don't. Yeah. Yeah. Daffy Duck is, you know, a different. Uh, he was my speech there. Get something. On so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, but uh, yeah. So the employee sentiment is always important to make sure that you're, you're tracking against. And, and a lot of organizations, you know, it's primarily done via surveys and other things associated to it that have poor poor response times and, and other areas. There's a, a couple of DEX tools and, and other things that we have that we leverage in order to kind of capture the you know, the question not asked, right? Looking at, you know, chat and other things, looking for uh, sentiment analysis that might show that, you know, uh, people that are, uh, you know, suffering in silence are quietly annoyed, right? You know, how often uh, will, instead of someone open up a help desk ticket, you'll just text your friend, hey, is Teams running slow for you as well, right? You know, for a, a, a meeting or a, a chat or conference that you've had. Or, uh, you know, did you guys have a problem with this? And being able to track and, and, and categorize that and aggregate that and then look at the different personas and looking for some correlation. You know, is it people at specific sites? Is it people at specific job roles using specific applications that have more positive or negative kind of scores associated to it? And then double clicking on that to identify what the real pain points and, and issues are. Uh, and those tend to be kind of some of that um, that critical pieces that um, organizations are missing, because if you're looking to measure employee experience, the ultimate measurement is what their perception of their experience is, because, you know, perception becomes the reality for them. Yeah, I was going to say that quote jumps right in my head as soon as you say perception, because um, I can't tell you how many times I've either been coached that when I was a young employee, you know, when I say, well, this isn't fair. And then, you know, my boss goes, well, that that's the perception. And I go, all right, I guess I got to yeah. deal with it. Um I, 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 I want to put the maturity curve up on here and uh, either one of you can walk through this, but I'm, I feel like most organizations are doing something, I think, no matter how formal it might be considered in terms of employee experience, because this curve notably starts with you've got nothing in place whatsoever is where do you tend to find most, you know, in your client experience, um, Jared, where, where do most customers tend to find themselves starting out on this type of thing? Yeah, really. The one thing that also sits behind this curve that we have is we actually have several different principles of what makes up this curve. And so what I'll actually refer to is a lot of organizations are going to find themselves varying not only just on this curve where they're going to land, but within each one of those principles. So they might actually be doing, you know, higher scores on, you know, maybe their sentiment, but they might be doing less on, you know, what are they doing for more some of their observability. And so what we're going to find is I'd say most organizations organizations usually end up somewhere in the, you know, two to three range, what we, we see. But what it's going to be, it's going to be this blended score. And really what our goal is, is to actually help them identify where where are they doing well? Do they need to improve that minimally? But then where, where do they really want to start increasing their score to drive them on up the maturity? And what is that roadmap going to be looking like? What are those gaps? I would disagree with Jared. I would say uh, most of the people that we run into uh, are probably sitting closer to the one and two. What I mean by that is they have some they have some siloed points of excellence. Maybe maybe they have really strong network monitoring tools put in place or something along those lines. But they're very siloed in it, right? Where um, they're they're only looking at it from that one lens all the way across, and they haven't really necessarily put together a cohesive kind of employee experience strategy. So they know whether or not the network's up or down. They don't know necessarily know how performant the application is across that network. So just because you can ping something doesn't mean you had a good video conference call, right? Um, so that's the kind of stuff that, that we, 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 we tend to see. And they may have like, um, they may have a really strong like network monitoring and they may have a really strong uh, device monitoring portfolio and maybe even a really strong, you know, backend application monitoring portfolio put in place. 
but yet there's no correlation that's been done between them, right? And, and when you look at kind of the bottom of this maturity curve, right, where we talk about, you know, no strategy and, and like DEX maturity is kind of nothing. We usually we see people move into like observability where they're observing, but they're observing in individual silos. And then we try to move them up in that chain where they've established possible processes in other places where they have correlation between the different stacks. So now they can see when somebody has an issue with, you know, Microsoft Teams or WebEx, right, that, oh, well, there was a network outage that was associated here, or, you know, hey, the application itself was having an issue back in the cloud app, or, you know what, your memory and CPU was at 10,000 different, you know, um, you know, 10,000% utilization or whatever along those lines, right? And then being able to mature that out to be able to generate those types of insights. Hey, certain machines that we have tend to, you know, their their CPU keeps going up crazily uh, every time we launch certain types of meetings and things. Oh, well, let's let's look into what that is. And eventually from there, figure out how to, to automate those repetitive fixes and other stuff. You know, oh, look, uh, X, Y, and Z happens. Let's clear the cache on that application, right? You know, and automate that to kind of uh, alleviate those sets of experiences. Because the idea is at some point or another to kind of create almost that digital transparency where people just do their job and don't have to think about it. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it goes back to, you know, uh, I always say that, that we failed a little bit in our employee experiences when you have to think too much to do your to, on the, the just the little all the little activities you have to do to your, do your job instead of doing the job itself. Yeah. It's the goal is to get to that frictionless IT, right? That's that's really where IT is not standing in the way of you doing your job. It's enabling you to do it. And, you know, I that that's that's where we're trying to go. And we find that, you know, where Dave kind of was alluding to is we find a lot of times we stop on the back end side. We stop at what makes IT's life easier and not what makes our users' life easier. But I feel like the big thing yeah. here with this curve that I really like is the distinction between kind of the first half and the second half. Because that third... And you said this, David, but I think it's important to highlight is it I think it's relatively straightforward. And a lot of people are in the ones and the twos, but getting to the three requires that cross crossing silos and, and getting past that and dealing with data and having to have knowledge. So IT suddenly has to understand how does that business work? How does that group of employees need what do they need to function and, you know, specifically to get their job done, not from a pure data and tool standpoint, but from an out, outcome desired, I guess, standpoint. Well, yeah, one of the things that we, we always look at from this perspective is uh, avoiding avoiding adding to tool sprawl, right? Uh, what we've seen over and over again in people's environments is they may have all the tools put in place to gather every point of data necessary for them to make better, to drive insights and make better decisions, to deliver a better set of experiences to their employees, but they haven't done the correlation. They haven't built out you know, dashboards that are meaningful to the line of business. They haven't, you know, aggregated these things together to see, you know, get a holistic view on what the set of experiences are, right? Everybody has been kind of myopically focused on their own sphere of, of influence and, and control. And, and, and nothing happens in isolation in any of the work that we do, right? You know, I mean, there's, there's no technology pillar that sits completely by itself. And uh, so for the IT people, as well as the, you know, whether it's HR or line of business owners or anything else along those lines, being able to give them actionable insights and derive insights out of these toolings is important. But I'd never advocate for let's throw another tool out there because we, we tend to be destructive of ourselves. Right. At that point, you've thrown so many tools on so many pieces of endpoint and so much shelfware out there like that uh, you, you're starting to have to buy more memory for machines just so they can run all the IT tooling before anybody even starts doing their work. You know, how many how many tools do you really need to tell you what applications are installed on the, the machine just because each one's going to a different, you know, either IT work group or compliance group or something else along those lines? In an ideal world, I always say that, you know, we would get to two tools, one tool to do all the work and the other tool to audit the first tool to make sure it did all the work. You know, do you feel like it, it, there there was a time when we would say historically, as as we were growing up with technology, it was easy in an organization to go, OK, IT handles technology in a kind of a loose way. But it feels like technology has become so omnipresent with every single business group that everybody is potentially purchasing tools and capabilities, much of which is going to ride on the network provided by IT, whether IT is proactively aware of it or not. How often do you guys run into clients that don't realize that they've got other groups maybe using some of the same tools or, okay. Yeah, that happens. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
I think my favorite is when a customer tells me they know everything that's running on their network. Oh, that's and always a great opening we, gambit. Yeah. We, we <laughs> proved to that. them it's wrong. Yeah. I mean, if, if you wanted a guaranteed win for a Vegas bet, that one's it right there is they're always a shadow IT. They're, they're always a something out there that they're not using. And it comes back to a, where IT doesn't, you know, they they get so focused on themselves and not on the users. So what happens is the users go, you're not meeting my needs. I'm going to do what I need to do to do my job, whether or not I do it with, with or without you. And there's, the, I Which don't has really been the fun part for most of us in this technology environment. I pity the IT department trying to get control of it, but hey, man, shadow IT has been a lot of fun well, I mean, for the individual. The, the the bit with the you know governance is important, right, and and all that. But if again, uh, if if you make it easier for an end user to to use the tools and the processes that you want them to, than to do something else, they're going to use it. I mean, uh, it tends to be people are like water, you know, path of least resistance, right? So if if you can if if you're hyper responsive to your uh, organizational needs and other things, then you can diminish some of those those areas associated to it, right? I mean, you're always gonna have people that have a, a core preference that came from somewhere else and demand to, to use a tool they use somewhere else, right? Because they understand that workflow. Um, but, you know, you, you can minimize if you have the right set of communication capabilities, as well as if, even if you're just, you know, similar to the dashboard and the other stuff, you can show the line of business that you're generally, you're incrementally improving their sense of experiences and you can bubble up what those kind of things are, then it can build a, enough goodwill for you to be kind of understood or brought in. So instead of uh, IT being the no department, right, that doesn't care, or doesn't understand what I do. Uh, so that, you know, they, you know, I, I'm just trying to do something to make my job easier, right? Kind of thing model from the, the line of business being there. Um, you're able to do that. But, um, conversely, we also sometimes have to, to convince IT that these tooling and these capabilities, while they have a very tangible benefit for you, right? Like automating and being a force multiplier for the IT personnel. The, the core goal of this is, is, is to be able to, um, elevate that, elevate those sets of experiences so you can be more responsive to the business and so that you can help to service up the organization because just, you know, um, just improving your own life should be a benefit, but you also have to kind of extend that out if you want any kind of longevity, uh, that's going to be associated with any kind of changes that you're trying to make. I want to get into the action steps that I'm going to go through all five of them here that are in the paper because I think they serve as a good recap for some things we've discussed, but also make sure we know to your own advice, how do we take action on this? Um, but is it reasonable? I feel like these days, poor IT departments and any of us trying to make this stuff work more fluidly, you know, uh, consumer technologies are setting a pace that seems next to impossible to keep up organizationally because organizationally, of course, we've got legacy equipment. We've got uh, processes that have to happen, people we have to report to, whatever it may be that kind of slows down, you know, with all the red tape. Is it possible? Because it feels like this builds a foundation of fluidity um, that then allows you to maybe be a little bit closer because, you know, if my example was uh, doing video within Cisco for a long time. It took a while. There was a, there seemed like in my impression anyway, was there was a gap between where I couldn't share large files very easily, but I knew that I could go out to in a box or a Dropbox or something like that and use those. But then IT's, you know, first reaction, a lot of those kind of things when they see it happening, of course, is to just stop it when the ideal reaction is to say, um, let's provide you with something that is just as easy to use, but follows within our corporate guidelines because we have governance policies. We have tools that know, we know what you're doing. That kind of thing. is it reasonable to expect that we can get there to where they're at least a little closer to being in lockstep? I would say yes. Uh, I think, granted, no matter what, you're, you're you know you could have a perfect three year plan within the IT estate, right? But as the market shifts and everything else like that, you know you're going to be five degrees off year one, another five degrees off year two. By the time you're in year three, you're you know a good twenty five percent of the way off, right? even though your map may have been a perfect path to start off with. And I, I think one of the things that the, the decks and the other areas associated to it is that observability kind of in correlation and stuff allows you to see how far you're drifting, right? And how to course correct and do other things where you can start to see, oh, look, you know, I'm seeing sediment drop. Why? Because now, you know, the files have become 10 times larger, right? So my previous storage and forwarding system set that we had is no longer fit for purpose. So people are running into friction and creating issues with it. How can I improve on that? Because before somebody goes out and buys, you know, 10,000 licenses to a product that IT knew nothing about, right? Yeah. Um, 
that that kind of stuff uh, becomes a little bit easier, I think, to see with a good kind of uh, DEX set of tooling and capabilities put in place. As long as you're, you know, as long as the, the spirit of it, not just the, because it's not one and done and tool put in, right? Yes. It, there's a lot of like, core, like active monitoring and processes that have to be put in place in order to close that feedback loop to help kind of inform what architecture is and everything else that needs to be and what the next generation of activities needs to be. Because if you don't close the loop on it, I mean, all, you're, you're dexing in the rear view mirror instead of looking out the windshield. Right. And that's the exact problem is how often you solve one problem and you stop is <laughs> that's what we see, you know, as being on the, honestly the biggest risk is just that stagnation is like, well, we knew there was a problem. We figured out what it was and we solved it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that, it was like, there's, well, not, security, there's not one we always problem. Joke. Oh yeah. We budgeted for that last year. Yeah. 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 And, it, <laughs> exactly. and it's, it's the, uh, and, and every tool that was put in place was to resolve a singular issue. Right. With no investigation back on, hey, we're seeing these other issues. Do we have within our inventory in our repertoire a set of tools that would already kind of fit into this, that we already have existing processes and capabilities that we could augment against? The, the amount of shelfware and under implementation that we run into is 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 crazy. Right. Well, I think a lot of it happens because we learn how to do these things from individual vendors who have a, a horse in the race, um, you know, and, and aren't concerned with the bigger picture. I want to make sure we mention because we talked about Opal, you guys offer uh, tools, rationalization, um, structured walkthroughs to help an organization. And I imagine that's part of uh, any kind of engagement you would be doing to help a client through this process. I want to go through these steps, though, real quick, just to make sure that we're not missing anything, because I think the very first one, uh, start by developing dynamic personas. I feel like that's really key. If you can just open this up a little bit more, I'll start with you, Jared, because I feel like dynamic personas are how you get away from saying, oh, I need one for all call center employees. No, it's not going to be something that's necessarily tied to a role or a title, correct? This is part of how we, we eat the elephant one bite at a time? It's it's the the grouping of your user not by title by but what they actually need to do to do their job and what those in, because then that becomes the foundation for us to say okay what are these what do they need to do their job and what impacts those you know what becomes part of that score and you know are certain things more important than others you know it's, it's you know it's the age old example but we all have seen it is do we have the exact same deck score for our executives versus you know our you know Hopefully cashiers. we're thinking of them differently. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a little different. And we need to measure them differently. But the thing is, more importantly, is each one of those have things that impact how they do their job effectively differently. And that's what we need to be making sure that we're monitoring and measuring properly. Yeah, I mean, if we look at personas as being the aggregate of, you know, the applications, uh, the security and data you have access to and the devices you kind of use to uh, to do your job, plus how you interact in physical space and other things, you know, um, it, you know, uh, you know, in your work style, all kind of build together to build out kind of a, a cohesive dynamic persona. You know, it's stuff like you used to see like mobile worker and all that as be like, you know, kind of these generic persona sets. But I would argue that um, mobile worker isn't kind of valid anymore in the hybrid space that we're in nowadays. Right. You know, um, you, you're you're it's just a flag. Like how often are you remote versus somewhere else? You don't necessarily need a uh, you don't want to make so many personas that everybody's a snowflake, yet y you want them to be balanced and nuanced enough that um, they can be meaningful in actions. You don't want everything so, like, you know, there's a distinct difference in a knowledge worker, even like somebody in HR. The way someone in HR that's in recruiting works and who they engage with, how they conference and all that is very different from somebody else that was sitting in benefits, right, in regards to what their work styles, who they're going to work with, who they're going to collaborate with and everything else associated to it. So those personas would not look as similar together as you think they would just based off of job title and, uh, and, and department. Right. Well, and to your, to your point about kind of this being an iterative ongoing process, it isn't necessarily going to have a start and a stop date. It's certainly not a stop date. Um, is the notion of, I would imagine you it's, there's nothing, there's no shame in developing some personas and then figuring out that you didn't do enough or you did too many and really looking at the data and saying, cause you want to constantly in that iterative process kind of retest your hypothesis, right. And say, does this make sense based on the Very actual often, data versus what we hypothesized? Yeah. It is rare that we walk in to a persona modeling exercise where no personas exist at all, right? It is usually always a persona refinement. 
And I always say, you know, going from a, a low definition to a higher definition kind of view of, of what's going on. And the idea is to make the personas actionable. If I'm going to treat, if I have two different personas, but I'm going to literally treat them exactly the same, then there's no point in putting two different tags on them. Right. So, uh, it, it's important to be able to do that. And then as you mature, I a thousand percent agree. You may have new personas that develop. You may have personas that you retire. Um, just because they don't have the same kind of meaning or, or differentiation that they maybe did previously. Yeah. Take action because any action is going to give you better data to then be able to make better choices. Just fail as fast as you can, as I say, I guess. Uh, number two, though, and this kind of gets, speaks to it is to prioritize personas um, to the extent that they would benefit from AI solutions. We didn't talk about about AI, but AI and automation, are, of course, part of the priority that was somewhat of our focus here. But I feel like those you know, uh, the biggest challenge with AI and maybe automation has been misperceived this way too, but is that you can't just slather it across an organization uh, <laughs> willy nilly, so to speak. Um, yeah. So we here. see two sides of the uh, AI piece contained within kind of the, like the DEX model set. One of them is AI recognizing and helping you digest and make sense of the data, right? And the DEX tooling and the other things itself and helping you to derive actionable insights because there's a lot of data that can be sourced from these things and being able to um, identify and pick and choose what's the data that's going to be meaningful. What are the metrics that matter, you know, um, and everything else and scaling those is, is critical. And, and AI being involved in that simplifies a lot of the process because there's just, there's, there's just too much data for one person to just stare at, right. Uh, in order to see real correlation and other stuff in different areas. The other side of it is, is we're seeing DEX being used to evaluate, you know, who would most benefit from certain types of AI tools and as well as what's the impact of those AI tools on their infrastructure, right? Um, and, and other areas associated to it because things like, um, you know, with all the tool sprawl and everything else that we put out there, if I start dropping high processing AI activities and other things on the same set of machines, I'm cratering them, right? So uh, DEX as a tool or a methodology to measure the impact of the AI tools uh, on your environment and on the employee experience, am I is the AI being more detrimental than uh, than what the benefit might be? Is is another place that we're seeing kind of interest and in, that kind of corresponds between DEX and uh, AI. Jared, number three says identify points of digital friction. We've mentioned the and that feels very outcome oriented because it's not saying identify places where websites fail or databases aren't responding or or failovers didn't happen the way they're supposed to. What is it meant by digital friction? Yeah, and this is where you've heard me say several times is, you know, it's really taking the perspective rather from the IT side, but from the user side is seeing what part of their interactions with IT in their daily life, what when they're doing their job that is causing things to not be optimized, causing them to slow them down, causing them to get frustrated with it, causing at the end of the day impact on our customers is going through and identifying what parts of those IT that is causing those and then you know, kind of marrying that then with the data that we're seeing or on the, you know, digital employee experience side. And also then tying that then what's going to be next is for the automations. Could we actually start resolving things, things without even getting a call to IT? Could we either re identify it and fix it ourselves? Could we give it where we empower the user to actually say, Hey, you know, do you mind if I take you offline for two minutes while I go fix this, you know, type things getting beyond the having for them to, you know, open a ticket, pick up the phone, open a, you know, do a chat and get to where we actually observe it. We know that there's this impact to the business, fixing it. And then the interesting thing we didn't talk about too much is reporting up what we're doing is being able to actually go back and say, hey, you know what? I took away something that was impacting, you know, our retail employees from being able to, you know, process a transaction, you know, couldn't cl complete a sale, you know, 20 times a day. Well, what was that dollar figure that suddenly we've reduced to zero? I love the whole idea of just quantifying success and then so that you know and can say, look, I we made these changes to help this group of people or this person, whatever it may be, to go from this point to this point. And suddenly now you've got data to to talk that really helps you because it's really I feel like I, I can see lots of points in here where this this does help you do the thing that seems very hard for many IT departments, which is to become a legitimate extension of the business saying, how do we work in lockstep to help advance each other's goals? Because we both need each other um, kind of thing. And, and I think you're hitting on the kind of the rest of the points. I'll just summarize through them real quick. Number four is look for opportunities to automate. Um, the point I want to make there, you guys, we've talked about this before also on other shows, but you have to be very uh, deliberate about that automation. And I think AI is falling into the same bucket where 
um, automating a bad process is simply going to get you faster to something you don't want. Yeah, I, I very often say, yeah, automation doesn't fix a broken process, just shows a broken process faster. And I think you hit on the head on, you know, when we were talking about the maturity curve, right? And we talked about like zero and one and setting the foundation and establishing observability. We don't move past that without like AI ops and other areas and good AI op process there. Cause you can't build out uh, without that AI ops kind of uh, enabler. You can't get into correlation. You can't drive the actionable insights and you can't eventually get to the automation of what makes sense. Because, yeah, you know, automating lemmings off a cliff does no one any good. And that gets right back to the I, I, the importance of, of kind of an organization-wide communication because more than likely, let's say you're embarking on this DEX uh, initiative, but there probably is someone that maybe has been doing more in AI ops. And if you guys aren't coordinating, then you're missing an easy route to some important data that could become a component of what you're trying to achieve versus you having or maybe wasting your time and money chasing after it on your own without realizing it was already there to begin with. I know it's always easier said than done for people to communicate because I'm the, I'm, I'm the worst at about, I'll sit there and beat my head against my computer for hours before I'll ask for help. Um, because I kind of feel like I can't even ask the question intelligently yet. You know, I just need to build up to the point of even feeling like I'm not a dummy with the question. Um, but the last point move from reactive to predictive. I like this contrast of not saying reactive to proactive, but this is everything that you both have been saying, but Jared, you most lately is this notion of that's the big goal, I assume, which is how do we, how do we, we have the ability today, we all can see it as technologists to answer a lot of problems before people bring them to our attention. But are we actually doing that? Do we have a pragmatic and, and deliberate way of maybe setting ourselves up to do that? Um, yeah. And this is, this is where AI for, from the administration side from the IT side is actually going to become a big part of it. It's, it's going to help get that machine learning. It's going to be able to help us be able to cross do cross these data silos to get in that correlation and helping us understand things quicker and faster. You know, we can use examples of, you know, where you're deploying a new update and be able to quickly see that there's a failure in there and be starting to tie that to predictive of going, Hey, if we see that a, this failure rate is increasing as soon as we did this, immediately stop it, right? Let's get to that predictive of let's not cause a worldwide outage. Let's go ahead and stop things before it rolls out. I mean, it can be our own world. It could be the world that, you know, in general is it's the idea is we want to be able to start identifying these things faster. And AI is going to be a big part of that for us is it can, you know, once it's got the proper data sets, the proper data models, and you know, what Dave was bringing up is not a bad data. We want, you know, good. Yeah. It needs good context. Yeah. Correct. Then we can, we can get to that. Absolutely. Well, with that, I'm going to ask David, I'll have you give the last word. What's most important to remember leaving out of this conversation? Is it really needs to be, everything needs to be a holistic approach. And if you can start off with the mindset of you're trying to improve the employee sets of experiences in order to just make, you know, with the idea that uh, employees, more enabled employees are better employees and a better business. And if you start off with that kind of mindset and look at holistically, what can we do in order to kind of generate that better set of experiences and reduce their friction, then that's the critical piece. And everything else kind of derives from that. Because if you look at it from that perspective, you know, how do I improve your experiences? Then it tells you what you should be measuring. And then that tells you how to be measuring it. And then that tells you how to correlate the information across the board. And then that tells you what kind of insights you're looking for and what kind of automation and fixes you need to resolve. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, David, thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Jared, you as well. Thank you. It's great to be here. Why is it important to remove digital friction? Well, here are some success metrics to consider. You can slash manual IT tickets through automation and self-service, minimize employee downtime from IT issues, speed up new hire onboarding, or as Rosenblatt would say, improve your mean time to productivity. I like that. And one that I want to make sure that we cover Create a source of truth that everyone can rally around. A live dashboard, your window into the entire workforce. You see, a DEX dashboard isn't just another IT tool. It's a communication tool that maps the entire employee journey beyond simply just looking at IT-oriented things. By fusing hard data with real feedback, you're going to see the direct link between employee experience, productivity, and customer satisfaction. We'll check out the full report, Digital Workspace Priorities for 2024, 
For topics like this, I also find it helpful to approach it from different angles. So I do suggest reading it for that reason, but there's a lot more value to ingest there as well with contextual links, supporting a lot of information published or authored, if you will, by today's guests. Thank you so much for spending time with us. My name is Rob Boyd. We'll see you on the next one. This episode is brought to you by Riverbed, the leader in unified observability. Unlocking the full potential of your digital experience has never been more accessible with Riverbed's AI-powered observability solutions and industry-leading Riverbed acceleration.